Can everybody who's in this room please take a seat? I'm sorry if you can't find a seat. As I said before, uh, there is an overflow room with a uh, beautiful high definition screen. I'm not sure how I look on it, but uh, you're welcome to go over there. Uh, my name is uh, David Wilkins. I'm a professor here at Harvard Law School and the director of the Harvard Law School program on the legal profession. Uh, and I have to say, this is, I've been teaching for now 27 years. And this is one of the most thrilling moments of my life. Uh, I'm not joking. We, we often say that at Harvard Law School, we try to bring the world to Harvard Law School, but this afternoon it is literally true. <laughs> uh, I don't think that there has ever been uh, with all due respect to our wonderful students, such a collection of distinguished lawyers and leaders from around the world uh, congregated here with us today. Um, I just want to thank all those who made this possible, starting with our terrific collaborators from the uh, International Bar Association, particularly President Michael Reynolds, who is here with us today and who you'll have a chance to hear from, but countless other incredibly hardworking and talented women and men who helped to organize this incredible occasion. I also want to thank deeply my own incredible staff at the program on the legal profession, which I am privileged uh, to direct. Uh, particularly Hakeem Lakhtar, who many of you know has done a spectacular job. He's hiding here in the corner doing last minute arrangements, but please, you know, come on, step out front, don't hide. This is him. Uh, who has been incredible, and we have an incredible uh, staff and uh, group of professionals who have helped us to put this event on. Uh, I also want to thank our student volunteers. Uh, when I realized how many of you were showing up for this party, uh, I said, we are going to need a lot of help to be able to welcome you appropriately. And I uh, made announcements to my own students, and others did the same. And we really do here at Harvard have an incredible group of students. They have name tags on saying student volunteer. Many of you have met them as uh, you were guided up here please take the opportunity to get to know them, to say hello, uh, to greet them, to tell them about yourselves. They are anxious to hear what their careers are going to be like. So during the breaks and during the receptions, uh, please look for them. But please thank, help me thank them right now for all the incredible work that they've done. But mostly, I want to thank uh, the person who has had more to do, not just with this incredible event, but with all that we do around connecting ourselves to the profession of the law around the world, for legal education, and for my own career. And that's our Dean, Martha Minow. Uh, Sit down, Martha, I have more things to say. Uh, so for many of you, Martha Minow needs no introduction. Uh, Martha has had a, an incredible career as a teacher and a scholar here at Harvard Law School, uh, stretching back even before I arrived, Martha, I have to be honest. Uh, and she has made her mark in an astoundingly diverse array of fields from constitutional law to civil procedure to international criminal law to family law to human rights. It's hard to think of an area that she has not touched. Moreover, she has been a role model for me and I think for many of us in the academic world about what it means to connect the great academic study of law with the most important practical causes in the world. She has been a champion uh, 
for innumerable causes, giving generously of her time and talents. Most recently, when President Obama appointed her to the uh, board of the Legal Services Board, where she authored a real pioneering report on pro bono services trying to connect what the government is doing with what many of you in your firms are doing. Since 2009, she has brought all of that energy and experience and enthusiasm and warmth and wit to the 12th deanship of the Harvard Law School, uh, where no one has done more to support the kind of work that we're trying to do here at the program on the legal profession and all the other parts of Harvard that touch the profession in this time of challenge. So it is a deeply gratifying personal honor to welcome to the stage my dear friend, Martha Minow. Good afternoon. David Wilkins, what can you say? Uh, David Wilkins had a dream about uh, having a conversation with people about law and its changes around the world, and he's made the dream real. This day is an expression of that dream, and the program on the legal profession and the Harvard Law School are incredibly proud to welcome all of you here and to partner with the International Bar Association on this uh, extraordinary event. Uh, it is a privilege for me to have the chance to address you, and I begin with this statement by the computer scientist Alan Kay, who said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. <laughs> the best way to predict the future is to invent it. That is what you are all doing. The nature of law practice, the nature of international business, the nature of communications, every aspect of our lives is changing minute by minute, and you are creating the structures, you are creating the technologies, you are creating the regulations, and you are creating the values that will guide us in the future. I think about what makes this moment different. Maybe everybody thinks the moment that they're living in is the most unique moment of world history. Certainly, it's the most important because it's when we are alive. But here are things that make this particular moment distinctive. We all know and live the globalization of markets, business, litigation, arbitration, everything to do with econ the economy, legal and professional services, but we also know we're living in a period of globalization of viruses, biological and computer, heightened interconnections between people, the mass movements of capital and people, the collisions in cultures, mores, values, the shifting geopolitical and economic power relations that are the result and also contribute to this globalization, the growing strength and global presence of countries that did not previously have great power, now have great power, and the transformation, therefore, of the relationships across uh, the powerful uh, governments and the less powerful governments. Secondly, we're living in a time of national and governmental uh, restructuring, national and regionally restructuring, whether it's following act, uh, hot conflicts or slow conflicts, whether it's involving regime change or in the pursuit of multi-level governance, as in the European Union. Third, we're living in the, the time of the digital revolution, when communications is uh, accelerating, altering the prospects for how people know and learn, how people discover what's going on anywhere in the world, next door or around the globe, the speedy transmission of written and visual communication happening right now. Some of you are in another room, I'm waving. Um, <laughs> and it's live and it's asynchronic. It scrambles all of our prior understandings about basically everything, ownership, <coughs> privacy, security, reliability, who's an intimate, who's a friend, who's a stranger. Also, at this time, we are living amid periods of persistent and accumulating issues of injustice mass disparities in wealth, health, corruption and abuse by governments and companies, burdens from global climate change and pollution, 
violence within homes, within cities, across regions, between nations. These are developments that pose not merely difficulties and misfortunes for us now, because someone once said that a civilization advances when what was once viewed as a misfortune becomes an injustice. And that's something that we as lawyers contribute to mightily. We say just because it's the way it is doesn't mean it has to be. So we live in this remarkable time and we have opportunities and we have obligations. What do lawyers have to contribute in this time? One of my predecessors, Dean Irwin Griswold, who graduated from Harvard Law School in 1928 and served as dean for 30 years, and I am not doing that. <laughs> he described the goals of education, particularly legal education, this way. He said, you go to a great school not so much for knowledge as for art or habits, for the art of expression, for the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, for the art of assuming at a moment's notice a new intellectual position, for the habit of submitting to censure and refutation, for the art of indicating assent or dissent in graduated terms, for the habit of regarding minute points of accuracy, for the art of working out what is possible in the given time, for taste, for discrimination, for mental courage and mental soberness. Now, I don't think I agreed with Dean Irwin Griswold about anything, but this is a pretty good list. However, there are qualities in this challenging time, in this 21st century, that are not on this list that I would add. And those qualities include imagination, teamwork, judgment, working in the context of cultural and linguistic diversity, and maybe most importantly, managing rapid change internationally, technologically, in terms of internal organi uh, organizations, in terms of individual identity. And so I'm gonna just briefly identify three challenges I hope that you touch on. I know that you work on them. The first is how knowledge can be, will be deployed in an era of new technology and commodification. Knowledge is the most important contribution that human beings have and that we make. We're living in a period of the disaggregation of knowledge, the commodification of knowledge, the turning of knowledge into techno technology. One of the most interesting developments in law, of course, is the use of technology. And the claim that's often made, it'll be cheaper, it'll be faster, it'll be less expensive. How many of you have engaged in technology and find it's not cheaper, it's not faster, <laughs> it's, not, it's not less expensive? An interesting development in the world of cyber settlement seems to me especially no notable. So, Cider, cyber settlement benefits cities like New York City where the city is turning to online management of disputes. And it's supposed to manage them by moving along very quickly and cheaply. Small claims that otherwise would not be worth defending in court. And that's gotta be a good thing. But here's the surprising result. It turns out because it seems to be cheaper and quicker, more people are bringing their disputes. So rather than reducing the backlog, it's actually increasing the backlog. This is just a hint of the complexity I would challenge you all to think about. I know that you work on it. What does the opportunity presented by technology bring to the knowledge businesses? Is it gonna be cheaper and faster? Is it gonna create more work, less work? How do we think about that? A second has to do particularly with how do we align incentives, assessment, and compensation so that we advance quality and not just the hours that we spend and the work that we do. Now, in large corporate law firms, the billing is such a problem that it generates regular jokes, lawyer jokes. They're not so funny, but I have to share one. <laughs> you know the one about the man who goes to a lawyer and he asks, how much do you charge for legal advice? And the lawyer says, 
$1,000 for three questions. Hmm. Wow, isn't that kind of expensive? Yes, it is. What is your third question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But to be somewhat more serious about it, <laughs> how do we evaluate our work in terms more than hours, more than minutes? What is the way to measure the quality, the value added? If we don't figure that out, someone is going to figure it out for us. The third question has to do with the investment in training and education of a next generation in a period of churn in a period when people's chance of staying in the same job for a career is diminishing by the minute, the disaffection that accompanies large law firm experience for associates is just one feature of this churn, but the pattern of people starting at one place and leaving in a year or two years is also, of course, an expression of the changing business models of those firms. Not surprisingly, the decision to invest in training is looking much more like a question rather than an assumption. So who will invest in training the next generation? Yes, law schools and other forms of education will continue to be very important, but we all know that it is elbow to elbow learning with others on the job where you really perfect your craft where will that be done in the future? That is my third question to you. And I hope that you think about that. I know that you work on it all the time. I am so thrilled to turn this over to people who know much more than I do. And I will do that in a minute, but not without first giving you two more thoughts about the future. The first is from Alvin Toffler, a writer, who says, the future always arrives too fast and in the wrong order. <laughs> The last is by someone else I can't believe I'm quoting, but here it is, it's Winston Churchill. He said, the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. I think that's pretty darn good. We are living in a time when knowledge is the value. So what will we do with that knowledge? What shape of empire will we develop? The picture I have looking out in this room gives me hope that it will be global, it will be distributed, it will be diverse, it will be energetic, it will have a good sense of humor. <laughs> it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Horacio Bernardes Neto, who is the chair of the Bar Issues Commi Com Commission and who has a, a small hand to play in this remarkable <laughs> event. Uh, as senior partner at Moda Fernandez Roca, a law firm with offices in San Pueblo and, and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he is one of the big players in the world when it comes to cross-border transactions, commercial operations, international public and private companies, defense of some of the most complex international cartel procedures in one of the countries that is transforming the world. And it is my great pleasure to introduce him. Well, I hope, uh, Dean Martamino, that you understand how excited you are, uh, we are, to be here uh, before I faint. But <laughs> it's really one of the best moments of the IBA. I think that uh, we, we are gathered here to examine how the future of our profession is going to be, and uh, no other place in the world could be better than the Harvard Law School, where ideas are exchanged, where opinions are born, where uh, uh, new trends are established for the world, where intelligent people gather, where intelligence kind of, you know, is all over the place. <laughs> so we are very, very much happy to be here. Uh, our profession is really changing, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will be able, as lawyers and as the IBA, and especially as the BIC, to understand those changes and to see what we can do with them to make our profession better, more beautiful, more just, more uh, responsive to, to what uh, society waits from us, 
And uh, this is, of course, a very difficult task in this moment of very, very <coughs> deep changes in the way people see lawyers and in the way uh, we also see our profession, and especially the way regulators do. Uh, in any case, I don't want to talk too much because we want to hear to people that have something to know, to, to say. I just want to thank uh, David uh, for this wonderful, uh, uh, I never saw and I could never expect you to be so responsive. I never could expect you to be so ready for us. Uh, from the first time that we spoke to David, it was immediately accepted, the idea. He immediately uh, uh, started to work, and, 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 and his wonderful team, Hakin, which is now, I'm seeing him from the first time today, but he's now my close friend, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and it was really incredible. I have to recognize that uh, the idea of coming to Harvard came from my fellow uh, 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 office uh, officer of the BIC, Claudio Visco. I don't know whether where is <coughs> Claudio is there, but uh, it, uh, there is Claudio. <laughs> so Claudio was the one that had the idea. <laughs> but I think we were able to implement the idea very well, and I want to thank my my, my fellow officers, Marjorie, Peter, uh, uh, Deborah, and 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 Soren, uh, who are really doing a great work in the BIC. I think the BIC is also uh, in a moment of change, in a moment of being, uh, of having another face, another importance in this association. And of course, uh, our wish is to contribute uh, to the association in a way that you can, that you can really identify uh, some issues that are worthwhile discussing and bring them to to to, to our to our membership. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think I have to, to stop now because uh, there is a, this uh, Luis de Camões, this uh, uh, Lusiades, says, uh, uh, stop the old muse, there is a better value that raises. Cesse tudo que antiga musa canta, um valor mais alto se levanta. And this is value, my Zalto, this higher value, is my dear friend, our president, who has been uh, very, very uh, uh, instrumental in uh, allowing us to arrive where we are. So we are very thankful for that. The BIC uh, has uh, changed because of many, but mostly because of you, Michael Reynolds. Thank you very much, Horacio. It's the most enormous pleasure uh, as president of the IBA uh, for me to be at this highlight of our week, um, the uh, joining together of the IBA with Harvard to present the Bar Issues Commission Showcase. And I would like to thank my great friend Horacio for all he's done, uh, not only for the Bar Issues Commission, but for the IBA in Brazil. And we have our first overseas office of the IBA was in Sao Paulo, and he's done an enormous amount Não sei se eu posso ser uma música mais alta. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Um, and I'm personally delighted because finally I have made it after many trips to the United States and coming to Boston and spending quite a bit of my youth in Boston. I actually made it to Harvard Law School. And when you're educated in law school in England, you always look with great envy at the great law schools of America and at Harvard in particular. And uh, at my at university, we had a professor who, who said to us, you know, if Moses, if Moses had gone to Harvard Law School, he would have written the Ten Commandments with five exclusionary causes <laughs> and a saving clause, <laughs> which always encouraged me. Um, we are having a marvelous uh, conference here in Boston. As you can see, when the IBA travels and the president and the officers travel, we do not travel lightly. We bring a large itinerant tribe with us wherever we go around the world. I'm very glad to see you so many of them here. Seated in this room, of course, uh, are the future of the legal profession, the students from the law faculty and those who are already practicing law, um, looking at the new structures, the new technology and the new regulations. 
living in a world where we are looking at outsourcing work to other parts of the world, storing clients' confidential files on something I think that's called the cloud, <laughs> uh, and dealing with virtual courtrooms and, what was it, uh, cyber settlement, cyber <laughs> settlement. Well, when I started practicing in the law as a young article clerk, as they were then called in Allen and Overy, we lived in the age of the telex. <laughs> Information was communicated through the telex, and the telex was a wonderful, most of the younger people in this room will not even know what I'm talking about, of course, <laughs> nothing new about that, but the telex was wonderful because it did not require instantaneous replies, and if a client asked you a question on a telex, you had time to go and get a gin and tonic and relax and, <laughs> an answer and reply. So I share... I have to say the Dean's uh, very eloquent misgivings about technology in Europe. Uh, there is always a certain amount of uh, ambivalence, as the French say, about technology. The French president, uh, Georges Pompidou, you know, when he was shown the plans of the new Concorde aeroplane, looked at them and said uh, to his ministers, you know, there are three roads that lead a man to ruin. One is wine, the second is gambling, and the third is technology. <laughs> and of these, the most pleasant is wine, the most certain is gambling, but by far the most dangerous is technology. So I certainly um, endorse that view. But I know today there's a fantastic program you've put together. You're going to look at all the um, challenges that we've got, and it's, it's really a magnificent panel of experts. And to say that we have many challenges and changes ahead of us is not an understatement. Um, and not every lawyer or every law firm will make the, main, the same choice. And in, in planning strategy, in looking into the future, it is very difficult. Um, there was a British Prime Minister called Harold Macmillan who, who said, what's the biggest challenge in politics? And he said, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> and those of us who, uh, I, I'm in a law firm which when I joined it had uh, 25 partners 90 lawyers and one office in London, and now it has uh, 490 partners, 3,000 lawyers, and 42 offices in 29 countries around the world. That's an enormous change just in my uh, brief span. Um, and in planning for the future, it is, it is the events, the, you know, the impact of the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, for example, had an enormous effect on, on the strategy that many of us followed uh, in Europe. The financial crisis in 2008 which many people just didn't predict, has had a huge effect on how law firms plan their strategy. I think it was your um, Secretary of Defence, Donald Rumsfeld, who said um, in, in planning strategy there are the known knowns. That are, those are the things we know we know. And then there are the known unknowns. Those are the things we know we don't know but then there are the unknown unknowns. <laughs> Those, he said, are the things we don't know we don't know. <laughs> and it's the unknown unknowns that are really um, a problem. And, of course, many law firms have made mistakes. Many law firms have made mistakes. That's normal. Winston Churchill, who the dean quoted, also said once that success in politics is the art of moving from mistake to mistake without any evident loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> so I really would urge you all not to be depressed if you make mistakes because they will be made. But I know we're going to hear a wonderful panel um, that at least, uh, despite the unknown unknowns and the events that we don't know are going to come, at least will enable us to, to help plan our way to the future. And it, this is a really unique occasion with the students of the faculty, with our um, great uh, experts from the IBA. And I would like to thank Horacio once more um, yeah. and, and David for all the work they've done to put this fantastic program together. Uh, I look forward to it with great, great pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it is my task now to, to, to first of all, uh, recognize and thank the, 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 the Law Society of Australia for the wonderful cocktail they are preparing for us <laughs> in one of those wonderful terraces after the, 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 the conference. 
thank you very much. That was, of course, uh, Marjorie's uh, another Marjorie, another miracle uh, of Marjorie. She's able to do those kind of things appear <laughs> like nobody else. Uh, and uh, to introduce uh, uh, our panel, I, uh, uh, we have a panel, with, well, actually I'm not going to introduce it then by, uh, David is going to start and he's going to, 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 to speak for some time, uh, uh, 20 minutes more or less, uh, putting some ideas together that will be then discussed by our three specialists, Gopal, Jonathan Goldsmith, and uh, Laurel Terry. Uh, each of one will uh, uh, touch one of the points of the, 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 the speech uh, that will be done, given by, by, by David. Just after that, we are going to break our coffee, and uh, 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 when we return, we have uh, two, one young lawyer and a student from this house, who are Francisco Rogero, and Aminu, Aminu uh, Gamawa. 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 Aminu Gamawa, who uh, will then occupy those two mics and will give some observations on uh, the, 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 the panel. And then we are going to open the floor for questions and answers in the second half. So uh, thank you very much again for being here. I hope you enjoy this afternoon. Thank you again, David, for all your uh, readiness to, to assist us in any time. Thank you, Elaine Owen, for putting it together. And uh, uh, let's go. Let's shut. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Thank you. While well, Hakim is yet helping me again with the curse of technology, I have to say, I always need help with that. Uh, I just want to, again, to welcome so many friends, former <coughs> students, uh, people who I've admi long admired in terms of the incredible work that you do in your own countries and for really this global movement. And Michael, for so eloquently keeping alive really the flame of the idea of trying to create a global conversation among lawyers, uh, which is a very, very noble task and an increasingly difficult one as the legal professions develop around the world. That's part of what I want to talk about today. But if there is any place in the world that has a chance of fostering that kind of global communication, it is this organization. And so again, I say it's why today is one of the most thrilling days of my life. Uh, but I won't just keep saying that. I'll try to say something that might be interesting or useful or uh, hopefully to create a conversation in this room that I hope will not end in this room, but will continue uh, for many, many years to come. So our topic here is preparing for the future. And I put uh, the caveat on the future that I think many of you uh, will recognize. That is, we're about to live a future in what we call the global age of more for less, okay? and. You know, here's the question I think we're all asking since 2008. Uh, you know, are we entering into some fundamental paradigm shift uh, in which things are going to radically transform in the legal profession? Or is it a temporary correction? Now, temporary, maybe it's gone on long enough that we aren't going to call it quite temporary anymore. But uh, I think most people in this room have lived through recessions before. Here in the United States, 1991. In fact, I remind my students that the hiring market was worse in 1991 and 92 than it was in 2008, 2009. But by 1993, nobody much remembered. We were off to one of the longest uh, boom times in our industry we've ever seen, with a temporary blip again in 2001, which had lots of uh, implications for a lot of the world, but actually turned out not to be so bad for lawyers after all. And by 2002 and 2003, we were off to the races again. So it's a legitimate question. Is it a paradigm shift or is it a temporary correction? Here's my deep answer. 
<laughs> Who knows? <laughs> if I knew that, I'd be, you know, as wealthy as some of the lawyers in this room. Right? <laughs> I, you know, it turns out, as the dean would say, you don't know if you're in a paradigm shift when you're in the paradigm shift. It's only when somebody writes the book 30 years later that says that was a paradigm shift that you realize you were in it. But here's the truth. I don't think any of us think that it's likely to be either. It's not likely to be, quote, the death of big law, as I've been to many a conference with that title. Uh, but I don't think we think it's going to be 2007 again anytime soon. And the reason is, is because what happened in the global financial crisis was not something out of the blue, although, as Michael, you're right, many people didn't expect it. But in fact, was the culmination of many important changes that were already going on that simply got shoved along by the financial crisis. And that these changes are fundamentally reshaping everything about our economic and political system. And of course, if they do that, law cannot be far behind. What are those changes? You all know what they are. The globalization of economic activity, and in particular, the increasingly important shift from what you might think of as the North and West to the South and East. Uh, my favorite statistic on this is from the International Monetary Fund. Some of you may have seen that did a projection on world GDP in 2010, projecting what it would be in 2050. Won't surprise you that the US UK, North America, Western Europe accounted for something like 41% of all the world's GDP in 2010. And if I were teaching this class, I would ask you to tell me what you predict the IMF says that number would have been in 2050. But I'm not teaching the class, so I won't ask you to do that. Uh, everybody knows it's going to go down. The only question is how far? Well, here's what the IMF predicted in 2010. It's going to go down to 18%. When I teach this to my students, I say, just let that sink in for a moment. I'm not talking about the US share of world GDP. I'm talking about the West share of world GDP. And that not only is Asia rising, as we know, and important countries in Latin America are rising, but my favorite statistic here is Africa, sub-Saharan Africa is destined to go from 2% to 12% of world GDP, making it the fastest growing region in the world. And if you add North Africa in the Middle East, the IMF predicted that that region of the world would go to 21% of world GDP, which means if you were doing your math, Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East could account for more of the world's GDP than everything we think of as the developed world today. If that's not a set of structural changes that are going to change everything, I don't know what is. And even if they're wrong by a large factor, no one doubts the direction of the change. The second is the rise of information technology. I often tell my students my first job was in the computer room of Commonwealth Edison, which I'll describe a little bit like the telex machine. It was a gigantic room, three or four times as big as this beautiful room, filled with giant machines with big tape drives spitting out enormous pieces of paper perforated on the edge. You had to dress up like a hospital orderly to go inside. <laughs> and all of it had less computing power than I held in my hand today, and this is nothing. Richard Susskind, as many of you know, has written this charming book called The End of Lawyers. Uh, he always reminds me that there's a question mark at the end, so that maybe there's hope for some of you. Uh, <laughs> but he, he's an expert on, the, on technology and its relationship to professional practice. And he came and told my students that by 2050, again, that magic date, that the average desktop computer, like the one running my PowerPoint, will have more uh, computing capacity, capacity than all of humanity combined. <laughs> now, I don't even know what that means, <laughs> but I do know that the world is going to be very different as we move towards that role. The second, is, the last one is sort of academic sounding, but hey, I'm an academic, I get paid to talk this way. The blurring together of traditional categories of knowledge and organization, you know what this means. It means that we used to think of things as being very different and separated, like the legal profession versus business, or the public versus the private, 
or the global versus the local. It's not that those categories don't mean anything, it's just that no one believes that they're as tightly constrained, hermetically sealed as they were before. When I first started teaching in 1986, I went to countless conferences called Law, is it a business or is it a profession? You know, it probably was a kind of dumb question then, but no one <laughs> would ask it today because it's so clearly both. It is a profession and a deeply meaningful one, but it's also part of an increasingly competitive global business. These things are reshaping the world. Again, why won't they reshape us? In fact, here's what's happening in the economy as a whole. First, there's been a huge reduction in what the economists would call information asymmetry between buyers and sellers. Simply just means the buyers are way more sophisticated and have way more access to information than they used to do, they used to have before, which allows them to take things that used to come all neatly bundled together by the sellers and to unbundle them and unpack them according to their own purposes across increasingly global supply chain. <laughs> the example I give here is think about the way I, and probably most of you, used to buy music compared to the way my students do. We used to have to go to something called the record store. Remember what that was? It was a place that sold records and you could only buy what was in the record store. And you could only buy it the way the record company wanted you to buy it. With, it was on a big album, 33 LP, with 15 or 16 songs, all shrink wrapped, all beautiful with cover art, costing at the time three or four dollars, which was like $50 in today's money. And you bought that whole thing for what? The one song, you're nodding your head, that they were playing on the radio. <laughs> now, to the extent that my students buy music at all, let that sink in, intellectual property <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> they go to iTunes and they pay 99 cents. Oh, that was so 2008, you know. They go to, you know, uh, uh, streaming media or Spoofify. I don't even know the names of these things. <laughs> and then they put together their own playlist and they take their little Galaxy phones and they click them together and they have exactly what they want. What's the consequence been? The, regular, the music business has been devastated, okay? Just think about that. Second, competition, the way in which we think about competition has moved dramatically. We used to think about competition as between <clears throat> companies or firms, kind of like warring states. Uh, and we used to do it on the basis of inputs, like the reputation or the credentials of the people, okay? Increasingly, sophisticated consumers don't care about inputs, they care about outputs. They care about value as measured to them because they understand enough to measure that value. So, here my example is the way in which people get medical operations. Used to be you went to your local hospital, the one you'd heard of, and you sat down in the doctor's office and you looked up at the wall and if there was a, a degree from a, re a university or a, a medical school you recognize, you were happy. <laughs> Today, you wanna go get heart bypass surgery, you can go on the web and look up the mortality rates of hospitals around the world. And then you can find out for the particular doctor involved how many times they've done the operation and whether they've ever been sued for it before. <laughs> and then you can look up the price. And suddenly you realize that there's a hospital in Bangalore, this is a true story, that has as low a death rate for bypass surgery as Mass General Hospital and the Cleveland Clinic. Only it's one-tenth the price. And so you book your tickets and you're gone. Medical tourism is exploding, changing the healthcare industry. And it's also changing the unit of competition. So remember I said, you know, we thought of competition as between companies or competition between states. Now those of you in the information technology business know we talk about networks. My colleague, Yohai Bankler, brilliant academic, has written a wonderful book which is a parody on a book that most of you have heard of. Not a parody, but it takes as its title a kind of a play on a very famous book. That book is by Adam Smith called The Wealth of Nations. Yohai's book is called The Wealth of Networks. And his argument is that value is created in the network. 
Think of the iPhone I just held up. You know, yeah, the Apple's is a US company based in Cupertino, California, but the iPhone is not a product only of Apple. It's made by Foxcom in China, which is, by the way, a Taiwanese company. The glass was made by Corning Glassware, co-designed with uh, engineers who worked between Apple and Corning. And the most important thing that makes the iPhone distinctive is the apps. And Apple doesn't make those or own those at all. Those are made by blurry-eyed 22-year-olds over cold pizza and some flat in Soho, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and all those things work together, and that's what creates this iconic product. All right, what does this mean for us? It means we have increasingly sophisticated clients who have more access to information about us and about what they want and are demanding more transparency from you. And they're forcing you to take things that used to come all packaged together by you called litigation or deal work and asking you to unbundle those things and array them across increasingly global supply chains and asking you to build them not by the input, but by the output or the value to them. It's also producing new competitors. You already heard the president talk about LPOs or legal process outsourcing organizations, electronic discovery, just one of a slew of new kinds of organizations. But we also see new kinds of firms that put together different kinds of professional services at the intersection of law, business, strategic consulting, project management. Some of them are called, or used to be called, accounting firms, which haven't done been accounting firms for 20 or 30 years. Uh, now are calling themselves globally integrated business solutions providers. <laughs> As my friend Maria Jose Esteban and I are working on a project on this thing, and guess what's part of a globally integrated business solution? Your job. <laughs> All this puts pressure on traditional law firm business models, professional practices, and the ways in which we regulate the legal profession. The problem is, we know all this is going on, but there's very little systematic, unbiased research about these issues, particularly by legal academics, where we, I think, have been grossly negligent in helping you to think about these changes that are reshaping your world. The program on the legal profession, which is the co-sponsor of this great event, is designed to try to address this problem. We've got three major goals. One is, just what I said, systematic, unbiased, empirical research on the complex issues facing the legal profession today. We have projects on legal careers. We have projects on how companies purchase legal services. We have projects on the rise or the reemergence of the accounting firms in the legal field. And one which I will tell you about in a minute about globalization. Second, we're trying to develop new ways of preparing students for these legal careers by teaching materials both aimed at uh, law students and conjunction with our terrific Harvard Law School program on executive education. And I'm delighted to see many of our alumni here and our new executive director, Scott Westfall, is sitting in uh, the second row here and I urge you to meet him. We are help trying to figure out how to teach Professionals, because of course education cannot stop no matter what we do uh, in the four corners of the law school. We've already got courses on leadership in corporate counsel and for general counsels and a number of other programs which we'd love to talk to you about. But mostly, we're here to create exactly the kind of partnership that this room is all about a partnership that between the academy and the profession, which frankly, let's be honest, has been frayed. Uh, it's not the case that the academy and the profession have been moving in opposite directions over the last 20 or 30 years, but it's not the case that they've been moving in the same direction either. We need each other, and we need to establish ways of talking. 
I want to talk in particular about a project that we have called Globalization Lawyers and Emerging Economies, or <coughs> GLEE, as we like to call it, uh, which some of you may recognize as a popular TV show about a singing organization uh, in the United States. I promise I'm not going to sing and I don't wear a tracksuit. <laughs> um, GLEE is, whoa, 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 stop. All right, uh, GLEE is a multidisciplinary, multinational research project to study the rise of the legal professions that are emerging in the important emerging economies around the world, like Brazil, India, China, many of which are represented uh, in this room. The catalyst is simple. We know that the liberalization of economies around the world have opened up markets in a way that they haven't really ever been before. That's led to an important consequence, which is that we need new kinds of law, new kinds of regulation to regulate these new markets and the intersection between domestic markets and global markets. But once you do that, you need new kinds of lawyers. What is it doing here? What is it doing, sorry? Sorry, here we go. You need new kinds of lawyers who are capable of operating within this framework. And we've seen the emergence of that around the world. And finally, of course, the emergence of new kinds of lawyers in different parts of the world have led to various kinds of competition, both domestically around legal professions and the uh, legal education and the control of the profession, but also globally. That's our goal. Our goal is to study this important set of issues which all of you are leading through. We've got more than 50 researchers on the ground right now looking at everything from the growth of large law firms to legal education to legal capacity building to uh, the growth of in-house legal departments to a range of issues that are around the emergence of important new kinds of legal professions and new legal institutions around the world. Just two representative projects. We're looking at uh, a survey of the emergence of corporate counsel and the increasing sophistication of corporate counsel around the world. I don't have to tell you that corporate counsel have become the major drivers of change. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But it used to be sophisticated corporate counsel was uniquely uh, first an American, then maybe an Anglo-American, then maybe a Western phenomenon. I think what we see is increasingly sophisticated corporate counsel around the world. And we're trying to study that development how it's happening, what they're interested, the way in which they look at law firms and the rest of the legal profession. We're also looking at the rise of global pro bono. Pro bono, again, used to be a kind of phrase that was a uniquely American or Anglo-American phrase. Now you can find important pro bono departments in almost every important law firm around the world. We're gonna have a conference that brings together some of the leaders here at Harvard Law School in the spring. And we're looking at the way in which the rise of a new kind of lawyer is reshaping the economic development in important new countries around the world. It's funny to call them new countries. India, China, Brazil are in many ways much older than the United States, but emerging economies, and also how that's reshaping the global economy. We run conferences around the world. We've had over 12 conferences around the world trying to focus attention on these issues, of which this kind of meeting is exactly the kind of dialogue that we have in mind. And we want to take this project to places in Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, to try to understand how globalization is shaping things around the world. There's a pamphlet, actually, I'll hold up here about the program on the legal profession. You could grab on your way out about the project uh, because we'd very much like to engage all of you in this discussion. Let me just say briefly about three preliminary trends that we're seeing which won't surprise you. The first is, of course, a tremendous movement around the world from law as practiced by solo practitioners to in practiced in increasingly large and diverse organizations. Second is the trend from moving from what you might think of as an artisanal craft idea of law to one in which technology is increasingly playing an important role in shaping the business environment. 
And finally, to talk about the regulatory framework as moving from a regulation that was entirely local in character, not even national, but subnational, to one that is a funny combination, and I quote my friend Carol Silver, who I think is in the room, it's global. It's global and local put together, and it's influenced by both public and private actors. First, institutionalization of legal practice. Look, let's be clear. Most lawyers still practice alone or in very small organizations. But we are seeing the rise of great law firms around the world. My favorite on this list, just to single out, is King & Wood Mallisons, which uh, first had, it grew to 1,000 lawyers only in China, then had a merger with one of the top law firms in Australia. And if you read the legal press and believe it, they could have a merger in the UK, a merger in the US, perhaps even in South Africa. And King & Wood Mallisons could be the largest law firm in the world in another year or two. Great law firms in India, great law firms in Brazil, and in many other countries. We're also, as I said, seeing the growth of, the, of sophisticated <coughs> in-house lawyers. I had the privilege of having the general counsel of the Tata Group as a student in our leadership and corporate counsel class. I said, how many uh, in-house lawyers do you have? He said, 400. <laughs> I have to say, I was shocked. Uh, we are seeing increasingly sophisticated in-house lawyers around the world. It's also happening in the public regulatory sphere. Increasingly large governmental agencies staffed by lawyers, particularly in regulatory fields, and even in the individual sphere. Legal clinics, prepaid legal services, various kinds of alliances. Many of you know Slater and Gordon, the world's first publicly traded law firm is now in the UK forming a, an increasingly large let network of plaintiffs' law firms. Huge changes. And these organizations are themselves increasingly diverse. Look, law all around the world has traditionally been a restrictive profession. I tell my students all the time, before 1960, anybody could be a lawyer. As long as you were a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant man of means, it was open to <laughs> talent. <laughs> Today, Law is becoming what the sociologists would call an increasingly feminized profession, meaning the majority, and in many parts of the world, the overwhelming majority of the entrants to the profession are women. Here at Harvard Law School, it's 50%. Many law schools I speak around the world, it's 60%, 65%, 70%. 70%. And yet, let's be honest, we not only have a career path that was built for a man, we have a career path that was built for a man who has a wife who doesn't work. <laughs> How many of those are left? This is a huge transformation. And we're not just seeing it here, we're seeing it all around the world. But of course, there are different kinds of diversity. And you all have your different uh, ways of expressing ethnic, racial, religion, linguistic, cultural diversity. And new categories that have just recently become a part of our lexicon around the world about issues about disability of various kinds or sexual orientation. And the most difficult diversity for lawyers, there are a bunch of, quote, non-lawyers in our midst. In fact, lawyers are the only people in the world who systematically divide the world into two groups, lawyers and non-lawyers, as if they are two equal groups. Here's a hint. There are a lot more of them than there are of us. <laughs> and as the world changes, as we have non-lawyer uh, owning law firms or investing in law firms or becoming partners in law firms, we need to learn to work across disciplinary diversity. All right, we're lawyering in the information age. Look, the dean said it best, law has always been an information or a knowledge business. But Traditionally, we controlled that knowledge. That's what it meant to be a lawyer, was to have the keys or special access to that information. But technology, for better and for worse, for whatever else it is doing, is democratizing access to information. It is so much more available to so many people and multiplying the uses to which people can put that information. This is having dramatic consequences for legal practice. 
First, we've already said there are new organizational forms that are built on leveraging technology to uh, create new forms of organizations. This is the key to legal process, outsourcing to electronic discovery, to new forms of legal research, new organizations. But it's also changing the way in which we're going to practice law, and I think Jonathan is going to address some of that. Look, how, who could exist? Actually, I'm very proud of most of you. You are existing without your blackberries, crackberries, or whatever else you've got in your pocket. Actually, if you have a blackberry, trade it in quick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, email, the cloud, you know, new forms of electric, electronic ways of getting access to information. But here's the biggest part. It's not mostly us that this is a problem, that issue for. It's our clients. Because they are using data, crunching numbers, looking in their own uh, experience, looking in your experience looking in the experience of all that data that you give to all those people who bill out those hours for you, who are collecting all the data and turning around and selling it to your clients to look for pattern recognition to do what? To try to find new ways to understand what quality means. So here's the good news. The clients realize at some point you can only squeeze price so much without affecting quality. But what they want to do is to think, how do we measure quality in this new age? Our newest project of the program on the legal profession is exactly on this. What is quality? How to measure it? And you know what the answer is? You can't, or I know it when I see it, is no longer going to be good enough in this age. <coughs> Finally, we've got professional regulation by multiple professionals. Again, we used to own this field. We decided who could practice law. We decided how law, a law was supposed to be practiced, and we drew the boundaries between the profession and the market. Today, we have a say, and thanks to great organizations like the IBA or the ABA, and I have to recognize that Bill Hubbard is going to take over the president, the presidency of the ABA in another uh, few months, uh, is here with us today. Uh, we have a say, but so do so many others. Look, the big changes are being driven by the state. The UK legal reforms, as Michael has said, uh, were, did not come from the bar. They came from a commission that was created by the government to solve a problem, Lord Clementi. And uh, the regulatory authority of the solicitors and barristers now reports up to something called the Legal Services Board, which is run by a competition specialist who isn't a lawyer named Chris Kenny. This is a big change. Clients are saying we're going to decide where is the boundary between what it is that is the craft of law and what is efficient for us to have. And they will enforce that increasingly as they grow knowledgeable. And finally, as Laurel Terry knows better than anybody, Legal services are wrapped up in a much larger debate about trade and services. Okay, and all of this is happening at the global and the local level together. Look, traditionally, law was bounded by language, by culture, by geography. Today, none of those things are as constraining as they once were. Nevertheless, there isn't any global language. And let me just say now, it's an honor for me to speak to people around the world in English, not a right. <laughs> English is not Esperanto. Anybody remember Esperanto? It was supposed to be a made-up language that was going to replace all other languages. It was only spoken by made-up people. That's how come nobody knows what it is. <laughs> but English is not a universal language. It may be one that many people speak. But language matters, culture matters, law matters. And while technology might allow distant contact, how many of you would be here if it was just on your phone? The result is a complex mix of the global and the local. All right, three quick things about your lives. One, you're being squeezed increasingly by sophisticated clients demanding more for less. You're being squeezed by lots of different competitors, 
Big global ones who, no matter how big you are, even your firm, Michael, somebody's bigger, saying, <laughs> oh, but we're in 52 countries, and okay? <laughs> or you're being squeezed by other producers who say, don't give us all of your work, just, just let, let's hollow it out from the inside. And finally, you're being squeezed by my students, let's be blunt. As my great friend Zia Modi said about India, we had the war for talent, <coughs> And talent won. <laughs> and talent will always win. That's very good. And yet, here's our challenge. We have to respond to these pressures. But if we're only seen as responding to these pressures, what will be remain of what's important to be a professional? Things like independence, craft, public service, commitment to the rule of law have been critical for us to attract all of you to this profession and to retain our status in our countries around the world. The loss of these threatened the best of what we have. And yet, contrary to some accounts, we, our clients and society as a whole, need lawyers more than ever. So what do we do? I think we need a new partnership. We need to bring every stakeholder together. Academics should take a leading role. So I start with us. We ought to be doing the kind of research that you need and that will be helpful to you in thinking about the tremendous challenges that you face. We ought to be convening gatherings where we can talk in a way that's beyond partisanship about how we can mutually work out our differences. But of course we need policymakers and professionals like this association to gather a debate about the multiple and sometimes conflicting roles that we are asked to play as lawyers. But mostly we need each of you. We need practitioners who will share their ideas, their information, and I'll just be blunt, resources. Work like what I do is very expensive. It, you know, the law schools don't support it in the way in which it needs to be supported financially. We raise all our own money. But the most thing we need is your time. And that's the most precious resource you have. Because if you don't talk to us, if you don't tell us what we should be looking at, how are we supposed to make the right choices? Which is why, of course, this is one of the best days of my life. Thank you very much. <laughs>of all let me say how pleased I was and what a privilege it was to have been invited to offer comments from a regulation perspective on David Wilkins keynote all I can say is how can I begin to do justice in 10 minutes uh, to all of the ideas in that wonderful talk um, I want to start by echoing his call for the tremendous need for collaboration among academics and the bar and practicing lawyers. And to give you just a small example of how much we are at the bottom of the learning curve here. As far as I know, there is no single place that you can go to to find out 
what the, who are the regulated lawyers in every country using their local title and who their regulators are. Um, so we don't even have that information to know who should, we should be talking among. So there's a lot of work to be done and something like this is a wonderful way uh, to advance the conversation. Um, global lawyer regulation is very much in, <coughs> in flux around the world. There are dramatic developments and there are so many developments that I think an easy way to try and keep track of all of them is to say there are developments with respect to who is regulating, who or what is regulated, uh, where regulation occurs, when it occurs, why it occurs, and how it occurs. So in other words, I can't think of any question that right now there aren't global developments. Whoops. Um, now, what I want to do in my brief time is try and put together some of these developments with uh, the comments that we heard in the keynote. Um, and so what I'm going to do is use the, some of the th many themes that we heard in the keynote uh, and highlight how they're coming up in regulation. Uh, um, and so, for example, globalization, economic globalization we heard about has dramatically affected uh, who it is that regulates lawyers. Um, 159 jurisdictions are members of the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization has um, GATS agreement, speaks to legal services, whether you've made specific commitments or not. The IBA has actually taken a leading role in this area by producing a handbook for member bars. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't picked one up at this conference, to do so. But there are lots of other global actors, the Financial Action Task Force, the Troika. Um, economic globalization has also affected where it is that regulation occurs. Uh, regulators have to figure out what to do with global firms. If a firm is going bankrupt uh, in a, located in another jurisdiction but has offices in your jurisdiction as a regulator, you might want to intervene. Globalization has presented thorny issues that we don't know how to resolve yet about whose ethics rules to apply and what to do when they conflict. Um, globalization, these global law firms, uh, has really raised issues about whether the one-size-fits-all regulation that many, many jurisdictions have still works when you have clients with very different needs. And globalization has, me has meant that all of these regulatory questions, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, are now viewed through a global lens in which regulators benchmark globally. And to just give you some visuals that emphasize a number of the points uh, that David made, um, we have seen, first of all, the charts on the right are produced, uh, reproduced from a 2010 World Trade Organization report on legal services. They're now one of the big actors and big players in, in how we think about legal services. They show you the dramatic growth. The top chart is just US and UK exports and imports of legal services. But as the bottom chart on the right shows you, globalization of legal services is happening around the world. And to the emphasize the point that David made about the shift in where global economy, uh, GDP and activity is gonna be happening, the chart on the left uh, shows you the uh, predictions of, about the BRICS growth in the share of the GDP. If you have your client base changing, where the lawyers are is going to change. Um, David also talked about technology's effect in regulation. Um, it used to be that regulation, at least as we thought about it, was relatively simple. Legal services were what pro was provided by lawyers and lawyers provided legal services, end stop. And so then regulation was just in that universe. But now because of technology, we all have all of these different providers 
And regulators are having to grapple with the question, do we regulate services or do we regulate providers? If we regulate providers, is it individuals, lawyers, paralegals, entities, and now alternative business structures? Um, technology has also led to questions about where we regulate. Um, it used to be that regulators, and they still are, they're geographically based. And they regulated the lawyers within their geographic jurisdictions because that's where the lawyers practiced. I bet many of you in this room, if not all of you, have been on your phones sometime during this conference dealing with client matters at, in your home jurisdiction. There's a mismatch between the virtual technological way in which law is practiced and the traditional geographic base. Um, Technology has also changed questions of when regulation occurs and how. Lots and lots of people are paying attention to the changes that were made, particularly in New South Wales, Australia, which have been studied, which have resulted in a dramatic decrease in client complaints. And regulators now use this kind of technology to talk to each other and share the results. It's made a dramatic, dramatic difference. The third point, a third point that we heard in the keynote was about these blurred categories in regulation. And we are starting to see, in regulation, we see some of these same uh, phenomenon that we heard about. We heard about the change metrics and a change from looking at inputs to looking at outputs. Well, a number of jurisdictions have commissioned studies to say what is it that a lawyer does on day one on the job? And are we adequately examining and regulating them in order to figure out whether they have the right skills and qualifications for that? So Australia, Canada, the US, the UK, maybe others I don't know about, and I would encourage you to tell me and share information in the academic bar practitioner collaboration. The Bologna process, which many of you know is not an EU project, but pan-Europe, has dramatically changed higher education and focuses on um, outputs. Um, in the US, we have changed our accreditation standards for law schools. We now look at bar exam results in order to be an ABA accredited law school, which lets you sit for a state bar exam. And the ABA is talking about even more outcome-oriented changes. Um, on the information um, asymmetry, I'll just make a brief comment with respect to why. Um, regulators are now, I've written about, there's a regulatory objectives movement going on now that I think was spurred in large part by Section 1 of the 2007 UK Legal Services Act. And people are asking why we regulate, um, or why they regulate, I'm not a regulator. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and part of it is in an age with uh, clients being knowledgeable in the info asymmetry. The networks that we heard about. Um, the uh, ABA Bar Issues Commission is a great example of a network. I learned this meeting about the new regulation committee, or new to me, which is gonna be doing a lot of things to promote networks. The International Conference of Legal Regulators, which was held last uh, September 2012, and again in um, San Francisco in this past August, are example of regulator networks. So we're seeing the same phenomenon that we've heard about in that context. So the bottom line is that the sort of structural changes that we've heard about in the keynote have definitely affected lawyer <coughs> regulation. And there are issues going on with respect to who regulates, what is regulated, when to regulate, proactively or reactively, where to regulate, why to regulate, and how to regulate, all of which are very much in flux around the world and very much influenced by the sort of factors we heard about in the wonderful keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura, very much for this uh, very, very enlightening 
uh, observation. Uh, I would like to call then my friend Jonathan Goldsmith. Jonathan Goldsmith, as uh, you know, is from the CCBE and will talk to us about technology, the technological aspect of the keynote. Whilst the slides are being changed and before my time starts running, I want to apologize to my fellow speakers for coughing throughout their presentation. <laughs> it's not because I was trying to put them off, although that would have helped me, <clears throat> but because <clears throat> this is not only the greatest day of my life, but the sickest day of my life as well. <laughs> Last night I was losing my voice and I thought I'd be like Marilyn Monroe singing <laughs> Happy Birthday, Mr. President, Madison <laughs> Gardens. But since today I am coughing like a dog, I shall use another ho Hollywood precedent. Um, and there is, of course, a famous Harvard Law School dog, and that's what I feel like today, and that's the Chihuahua held by Reese Witherspoon in Legally Blonde. <laughs> so uh, excuse me if I cough. Um, I'm here to speak about uh, technology. Um, I am Secretary General of the CCBE, which is the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. There are going to be many photos pictures of Europe, all with different colors and different countries highlighted. You might think you've stumbled into international diplomacy pre-1914 <laughs> class. Um, this is a map of our members, um, and altogether we have 32 full members from 32 countries and 11 observer members, and we represent over one million lawyers. In relation to the changes in technology which I will be speaking about, I'll be speaking about three because we have very little time. Number one, governmental mass surveillance. Two, cloud computing. And three, lawyer identity. The future is unpredictable. If we'd been having this uh, talk last year, we would not have been talking about governmental <laughs> mass surveillance. Um, but since that time, Edward Snowden made his revelations. Um, and we now know that professional secrecy, lawyer-client privilege, whatever you call it in your country, uh, is more or less dead. There, the European Court of Justice said that there were three core values of the legal profession, independence, uh, avoidance of conflicts of interest and professional secrecy. Well, if you were Edward Snowden's lawyer and you were communicating with him in Russia, would you say that your communications with him would be subject to professional secrecy or not? <laughs> and those law students here, don't sit in here listening to us boring people. Go out there and protest. <laughs> <laughs> your future, your future profession has been, had one of its three main pillars taken away. And I think that's the first big change which we have seen recently uh, in technology. I know it's only governments at present, but we know that uh, this kind of holding of data can be abused. We've already heard that some of the agents use it for their private revenge purposes. Who knows who's buying it off them? Uh, so for some time, I suspect we have the end of professional secrecy and the solutions are long-term only. There's not going to be a solution tomorrow to protect lawyer-client secrets from the NSA. This is not an American point. The UK government has been spying. Many governments have been spying. Uh, the technology is so strong that nothing that the bars can do and nothing that anybody can do uh, is going to work for some while until we get our head around how once more we can reintroduce professional secrecy uh, into the lawyer's work. Cloud computing raises a bit of the same issues. Uh, cloud computing uh, is where uh, data is stored outside the lawyer's own office and those of you using your devices, I hope nobody now whilst I'm speaking, uh, almost <laughs> certainly your data is being stored on a cloud. Do you know where it's being stored? Do you know subject to what contractual terms it's being stored? Are you going to have access to it? Uh, a, a huge range of questions. This is not a, a, a session on cloud computing. We could spend all day on it. Uh, but there are large issues relating to the storage of client data uh, on the cloud. Bars are faced with the first question up there. 
Is it possible to say to lawyers you cannot store data on the cloud, given the widespread use of cloud uh, computing, given the, its, its extreme efficiency? Uh, there's the balance between convenience and security, and this is an, a live issue which bars are facing all around the world. We've developed guidelines, the CCBE, uh, on this and working on further ones. Is a private server any safer and any better? That's a very good question, and we're now hearing that... Um, uh, some law firms are returning to typewriters for uh, <laughs> for, uh, for those client matters which they are unable uh, to rely uh, because they are you know, presumably, uh, well, I'm not sure what Mr. Snowden's lawyer could do. We see that if you send a go-between, he gets arrested at Heathrow Airport. Uh, he might have his plane brought down in, in Vienna <laughs> Airport. You know, if the governments want to have access to it, they'll have access to it. So there are big issues around cloud computing, which again are more or less insoluble for the time being. And bars have to decide which way they go for the convenience or the security. And some bars, like the French bar, take a very purist attitude and say you can't use cloud computing. Others take uh, a, a more convenient line, I would say. This is where we move from legally blonde to another Harvard movie all about uh, Facebook, the social network, <laughs> as I try to show you uh, something which we're doing in Europe. We're now talking about uh, lawyer identity. Um, and with uh, government help, we have set up something which we call Find a Lawyer One. And this <laughs> is uh, around um, uh, lawyer identity because after Find a Lawyer 1, we have Find a Lawyer 2, as I will explain. <laughs> so, now, we are now here, we are going live on a test site. We're going to look for a lawyer in Austria. These, the data which you're getting here is all bar data. This is not self-selecting. This it comes off the bar's electronic databases. So, I want to look for a lawyer in Vienna. Uh, no, I spelled it wrong in my nervousness. <laughs> there comes Vienna. And then we can go to the drop-down list and we will choose uh, the English language, if I can find it, yes. And we will choose intellectual property as an example. To, and we will see wh who are the English-speaking intellectual property lawyers in Vienna. And uh, the answer will come up. It is randomized. It has to be randomized. Here we are. You see a whole selection of, uh, of, of lawyers' names who come up. Now, I ac actually happen to know uh, an intellectual property lawyer in Vienna who doesn't uh, come up with that list. So I'm going to type her name here. She is our uh, last year's president. Those people who know her, please tell her that I used her name at Harvard Law School. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will search. And there you see Dr. Marcella Prunbauer. And you can click on her name. And you will see even where her office is. <laughs> so, uh, very good. Um, so, we have, we are, this is about to go live, and we'll go live in a month or two, um, and that is how you will then be able to search for lawyers in Europe. Based on that, we are now developing Find a Lawyer 2. Don't worry about the diagram. It's very complicated. Find a Lawyer 2 is using the electronic data from Find a Lawyer 1 to prove a lawyer's electronic identity in cross-border proceedings because cross proceedings are becoming cross-border now and so why should you not be able to register a company i am an english solicitor i want to register a company in milan why must i go to milan why must i instruct an italian lawyer why can't i from uh, England register this um, th this company under the lawyers free movement directives I have a perfect right to do so um, and we are now building the system whereby lawyers will be able to prove their identity electronically using the kind of data this find a lawyer too will go hunting for my name uh, in the law society list bring it out and say this person is a lawyer and so that is another of the aspects we need to uh, look for in the future. This uh, Final Lawyer 2 is taking place, and I told you, lots of maps of Europe, um, <laughs> under another project which is called eCodex. You can look it up on the website. That list of governments down there 
are the governments who are participating in trying to make electronic cross-border proceedings in Europe a reality. It's a multi-million euro project. And it's worth mentioning here in the United States that when we come to the United States and say, you guys need to know what we're doing in Europe because the template we're building is going to be a powerful template which, if it works, will be used beyond Europe. Um, and they are very interested in it, but in the United States, the government response is that the private sector must develop uh, solutions, and they don't put government money into it. We are all old-fashioned European socialists. <laughs> the government has a role. The government has been putting money into it, and as a result of that, we are building uh, this uh, uh, lawyer e-identity procedure. Well, there we go. I didn't cough once. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, for such great remarks. And now, uh, before we go to the coffee ba break, and we are going to shorten a little bit up the co coffee break, we're going to, to, to break just for 20 minutes, uh, uh, and then have Francisco and Amino uh, 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 with us. I would like to pass the floor to my friend, Gopal Submaranium. Uh, he's a council member of the Indian Bar, and uh, is also very active in the BIC. Actually, I forgot to say that Jonathan Goldsmith is the secretary of the BIC. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Very good. I hope that uh, Dean Martha Minot has not left the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she started with three splendid points. One was about knowledge, the second was about compensation, and the third was about training in legal education. But uh, she also spoke about a phrase which was about distributive uh, justice. I think we live in a complex world. Obviously, there is globalization. Obviously, there is increasing corporate responsibility. Um, I have to congratulate David Wilkins at the kind of blue papers which have been presented by uh, various young, brilliant uh, heads of law firms in India about the struggle between globalization and the Indian legal profession. But I'm sure it's not only about India. It must be quite true of many other countries. I think there are three important aspects which we need to consider. Uh, that is, Undoubtedly, there is growing intersection between law, business, commerce, transactions, and shall we say, a complete change in terms of technology, structure, and of course, naturally, the regulatory structure. This, I think, goes without saying. It would be completely foolish to shut our eyes uh, to this uh, enormous uh, transformative change which is happening. Uh, which is almost like uh, synthetic biology, where uh, you have cells which, which uh, duplicate even faster than the normal Darwinian evolutionary pace. It is indeed uh, something which we have to confront with. But I think the challenges are possibly a little more subtly nuanced, I would say, and in my view, we have to look at the role of the legal profession in each country somewhat distinctively, in addition to a global context. And this distinctiveness <coughs> is somewhat rooted in history. It is rooted in the uh, pluralistic nature of the society in which the legal profession is. And thank God that there is a legal profession in some societies, and imagine that if you don't have a legal profession, what would be the state of the society? So I think the first thing is that while we look at the future in this extraordinarily fascinating Star Trek uh, <laughs> way in which David put it, uh, I think we also have to take some steps to preserve the fundamental character of the legal profession 
we should just not give that up, uh, even uh, willy-nilly, by oversight, by looking at uh, change, by looking at dramatic change. Uh, well, there can be even more dramatic change, but I think it's necessary first to understand that legal profession is the most important concomitant of the rule of law, and it is essential that it's independent, a political, and somewhat highly robust character must be maintained. Obviously, this has got to interface with knowledge. It has got to interface with changing dimensions of different disciplines. Uh, indeed, uh, when I read uh, Martha Minot's book, uh, In the Wake of Brown, which she wrote about uh, the Supreme Court judgment, I could see she used very symbolic metaphors. And in a certain sense, the legal profession is symbolic too, apart from the hard-headed commerce, which we are talking about. And I'm going to raise three points. The first is that in societies where political structures are important and they need to be conditioned and checked by constitutionalism, it is the legal profession which is the symbol of constitutionalism. And I want to make that point frontally, that uh, in countries where you may have mature democracies, where uh, we all extol ourselves with platitudes about the largest democracy in the world, yet you have executive excesses, yet you have trespasses on human rights, yet you have, shall we say, completely unfair treatment to business, whether it's domestic business or whether it's transnational business. In such situations, I think the first important thing is that the legal profession must be extremely robust and well-equipped to deal with this. This is the first aspect. The second is, uh, undoubtedly, technology has overtaken all of us. But uh, in a certain sense, the individual brilliance yields in a certain way to the, uh, to the particularity of the written word on the computer screen. We're no less as, uh, you know, in the Shakespearean sense, we're no longer a touchstone or a bowling broke. We are uh, somewhat impersonal in this moving mass of globalized world. <laughs> Yet, we need to understand that technology must be used for accountability, self-accountability of the profession, and also offer accountability in terms of services to all our clients. The third point is about structure. Now, structures are different. Of course, the individual lawyer is disappearing, but there are dangers in extinction of individual lawyers. Because in countries where you need the individual lawyer as the first resort of access to justice, it may be simply impossible for him to afford the fees of a firm, one of the firms which you mentioned, let's say one of the firms, and all firms have uh, ostensibly <coughs> pro bono policies. But whether they are in fact pursued in actuality is again a matter for the regulator to consider. So today a regulator, let's say in India, would have to deal with multiple kinds of situations. The individual lawyers, the law firms, which I must tell you as an entity is not recognized in India, but certainly I think the law should be amended and they must be brought under a special category. And the 10 principles in the SRA uh, are absolutely magnificent. I think they sum up, in my view at least, the, the fundamental outcomes-based approach which should exist in today's legal profession. It is, uh, it is very well worded. It, I think, takes into account my spectrum of concern from, shall we say, being able to resist political excesses on the one hand and also to provide outstandingly efficient services on the other. And the third thing is you've also got LPO. And LPO is not really the practice of law. Uh, it can be a computer operator who could learn with excellent uh, knowledge of the English language, use the right keys, the right arrows, the right buttons, the right editing, and he can actually come up 
with uh, extraordinary material as a part of a transcript. Uh, I wish to tell you that uh, uh, before, uh, before I see the clock ticking away, <laughs> that danger of technology it can be manifest in, uh, in tremendous errors in adjudicatory processes. I'll just give you one example and close. There was a judgment, and it was in a criminal case. It cited uh, Justinian statues, and it was uh, something which we were trying to figure out in various libraries and computer um, databases. Uh, we looked at Westlaw, we looked at all over the world, and, and yes, and we figured out that. And then we realized that how is it that this passage is there in the judgment? Uh, we found uh, by a process of turning it around that uh, the law clerk who, uh, who wrote out the opinion had chosen to use the cut, copy, paste and put the latter half of a page at the top. <laughs> and we spent three days in trying to solve this riddle, but fortunately we solved it. So I think somewhere we must know that uh, this topic is absolutely fascinating. The future right. is yeah. as cosmic as David put it. He has virtually caught hold of all the stars and the galaxies <laughs> and pulled them into the Harvard Law School. <laughs> but I think we still will have to have our feet firmly on the ground and be open, I think, to tremendous advances uh, in knowledge. And lawyers, fortunately, as David, you put it, we are also non-lawyers, <laughs> uh, which is that we are continuous learners and we can deal with any branch of business and accounting, and we've got the capacity to learn. Uh, we are the only profession who can rightfully claim that we use virtually most of the neurons uh, which, which lie in the cerebral cortex. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to thank uh, my three magnificent commentators for well improving on anything I might have said. Uh, we're going to take a, a we're 20 minute <coughs> break. There's coffee and other uh, things that are across the hall. So you can just go straight out these oh, no. doors. Or, oh wait, oh it's in the courtyard. It's both, okay, that shows what I know. So the courtyard is beautiful or across the hall. Please try to be back by about 440 so that we can have time to hear from you. It's such a distinguished audience. Thank you. Well. <laughs>